Okay. Actually, I start from here. Okay, so welcome everybody to the last session, the very last session of this very nice school. I, I enjoyed it very much so far. Uh, so for uh, this last part, um, I'm going to go back to a bit more uh, conceptual uh, and uh, higher level uh, uh, descriptions. So there will be some formalism, but uh, not really as much as uh, uh, the previous two lectures. And uh, um, I think there should be enough uh, for you to understand the concept, even if you uh, didn't get all the details of what we discussed the uh, last two times. Uh, so this is the, um, roughly speaking, the, uh, the topic, and we'll explain what it means. Actually, the expression is not really well defined, but uh, often people use this expression talking about this topic. And this archive uh, reference here is uh, uh, what I recommend as an introduction to the topic. So if, uh, if what I'm talking about today is what you find more interesting of, uh, of this series of lectures, then uh, please start with this. If you're more interested in more applied stuff as we were doing before, then I, I get the reference. And uh, if I remember, maybe someone will gibber, maybe I will uh, try to remember, I can uh, prepare some PDF file with uh, a list of references and then we can distribute around. Uh, and remember, as I announced yesterday, that uh, we will have an option, uh, this lecture, to choose between uh, two topics, how to end. So one topic is uh, how to use what I will discuss today to draw some computational advantage. So this is something that in principle has applications. There are experiments that are being performed right now. And the second option is uh, more foundational. It has to do with quantum gravity. There will be nothing at all uh, about the actual uh, uh, formalism of quantum gravity, but again, at the conceptual level, how uh, what I will discuss uh, can arise in a context where the uh, um, uh, gravity is not uh, classical. Okay, so um, uh, the topic of this lecture, and in fact, uh, uh, the topic, uh, uh, even maybe if it wasn't very explicit of uh, uh, everything until now, uh, can be summarized uh, as uh, uh, talking about causal relations. Um, so uh, you might be surprised of how much people actually have uh, uh, debated and uh, keep debating, uh, uh, trying to decide what does it mean, what are causal relations, what does it mean, and uh, uh, how should we interpret them, how should we understand them, how should we really even define uh, causal relations. Might be surprising because uh, you will think that uh, uh, causal relation and causal structure is uh, the bedrock of all physics, but people actually debate about those things. Uh, so I will uh, uh, use a notion that is very much um, uh, in use nowadays, that is uh, 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 how people interpret causal relation, both from a pr practical point of view. So if you want to know if, uh, uh, I don't know, eating a certain food will get you sick, uh, but also how uh, a notion that can be used uh, uh, to discuss fundamental physics or physics as I will uh, uh, talk now. So the notion is uh, uh, very practically oriented, essentially to say that uh, some event A is a cause of event B means that uh, if we can change uh, something at event A, we will observe uh, a change at event B. So note, note that this is very different to just say uh, we observe uh, uh, some value of A coming together with values of B. So if you say something like, uh, um, well, um, what is an example? I see rain falling, and then uh, I see that uh, a pond of water gets filled up. Uh, this by itself is not a causal relation because it's just correlation. You see that water uh, falling and water going up, no water, water going down. It could be that maybe uh, um, the, the, the rain is not directly caused. Maybe um, there is some common relation that when, uh, um, well, this example is maybe not very good, um, but uh, it could be that maybe there is some common cause that is first filling the water and causing the rain. Um, so how do you how do you recognize the causal relations? Uh, you can try to intervene to make an intervention to actually change the variable. So if you think you can, uh, for example, cause rain, you will come with some plane that uh, uh, managed to make a, a cloud go down, and then you observe if the water is actually rising. Or you can, on the other hand, uh, throw water in the pond and see if that causes uh, rain to go down. So you wouldn't expect it. So the point is that uh, if you want to uh, define what does it mean that A causes B. This in principle is defined by saying that by changing A, not just by observing A, I will observe a change in B. So it's a relation between a chosen variable and ob an observed variable. And there is a whole discussion, how do you define chosen? Does it imply free will or anything like that? We'll not enter into any of the philosophy, just uh, uh, we imagine that for practical purposes in physics, we will uh, 
typically know what does it mean and which variables can be, uh, can be chosen independently, can be set independently. Um, so uh, mathematically, uh, um, how do we represent? And, and let me stress the causal relation uh, implies some possible, uh, to say that A is a possible cause of B, means in, in general we can imagine making a change at A that will influence B. It doesn't mean that uh, uh, in a particular uh, instance you're actually doing this change. So if uh, you manage to infer that the rain is actually causing the, the pond to grow, to rise, this is true even if you're not actually uh, um, uh, throwing the rain yourself. So once you, uh, in some way, establish that this is true, uh, then this remains true uh, in all other cases, even when you don't actually do some intervention. So this is known as the interventionist approach to causation because uh, it identifies causal relation with uh, some intervention. And again, uh, this is just terminology. We don't have to, to imagine humans. We just have to imagine that we can decide what are uh, independent variables. But, uh, but we, we will stick to a kind of operational approach because uh, it makes it easier to understand. So operationally, uh, we imagine that we have, uh, um, uh, what we have is uh, two uh, possible events. Let's just throw them at the moment as some box. And let's imagine that we can change something uh, at one event. And these boxes are very similar to what you saw uh, with Dennis uh, the first two days. So at this box, there is Alice. She can choose a variable. And now for the moment, I will, I will not say anything of what is going on here. Just imagine that there is some classical variable, 0, 1, or whatever, that tells me what is chosen here. And then she might observe some uh, uh, measurement outcome A. Or she must, might observe some physical variable labeled by A. And similarly, Bob uh, chooses Y and detects B. So now, when we do this in some uh, physical scenario, uh, we will uh, um, uh, we will get some probability P A B given X Y. So for example, uh, um, Alice might have uh, um, some particle and uh, she might uh, observe uh, the particle and see if uh, it's uh, spin up or spin down. And then, uh, and that will be her uh, uh, output A. And then she might prepare uh, another particle and this could be again spin up or spin down and that is X. In particular, uh, when I draw these lines, uh, there is no implication of what is the rel relative uh, time order between X and A. These are just labels that label uh, a choice, X, and an observation, A. So uh, what does it mean that uh, um, uh, the event, uh, something on this side has causal influence on that side? It's easier to define it in the negative. So we have to say, okay, let's look at the probability for B alone. So we ignore the output for Alice. So this is given by the marginal b x y given now by the sum of a a b x y and now let's see if this uh, depends in the sense if uh, it stays the same or not when uh, we consider different values of uh, uh, of the setting if we call it or uh, the uh, the choice of alice so if uh, the probability for b is the same for whatever alice chooses then we will say that uh, uh, if this is box A and this is box B, we, could, we will say that A does not signal to B, and we will interpret as saying uh, A has no causal influence in B. Conversely, if, uh, uh, if you can find some variable X and X prime that makes this probability difference, then you will say that A has causal influence in B. So practically speaking, it means that uh, we can send a message. It might be a noisy message, but uh, by change, changing X, we can send a message to Bob that will, Bob will read it uh, by reading B. Okay, so this is uh, at a very broad level uh, how we interpret causal relations, and uh, that's typically how uh, it is discussed in the foundations of, uh, of quantum physics, at least. So how, why do I say that uh, uh, until now we have discussed uh, causal relations? Because essentially what we're seeing is uh, more and more complicated uh, uh, types of causal structures. So the, the simplest types were just states, so um, remember now uh, these pictures, again, interpret them physically as uh, describing some, uh, some state that is prepared. And uh, there is one particle at side A and one particle at side B. And now states are things that can be measured. So I will now just draw some measurement symbol. And I will not uh, go into the detail. Uh, you have seen how to translate all these pictures in. Uh, in, uh, in formulas, but we will not uh, uh, look into the details of, uh, of that. 
And now you can ask uh, the question, so uh, if we fix, so here we have some measurement and could have some setting X. So in this case, it could be, for example, I decide if I want to measure a spin up down or if I want to measure left and right. In quantum physics, we have a choice of, uh, of measurement. And now if we choose, uh, if we ask what is the uh, marginal probability for B, we will take the sum over A of these things. By. And this will be equal to just the reduced state, the measurement on the reduced state. So um, this is the property of uh, uh, P of yet measurements, but uh, simply stated, we are just saying, uh, uh, if I make a measurement with outcome A and uh, um, setting X, if we ignore the, um, the outcome, uh, it's just the same as ignoring the fact that I'm doing the measurement altogether. Okay, so this is very intuitive. We have two particles. I measure on this side, but I don't know the, the outcome. It's just as if I'm not measuring. And so this is true in quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, states are no signaling. It means that uh, uh, if I have a bipartite state, I measure one side, I cannot causally influence the other side. And keep in mind that uh, uh, sometimes a different terminology is used. People sometimes say that if you have two entangled particles, then when you measure one, this has causal influence on the other. Uh, this doesn't fit with uh, this description because you cannot actually send a, a message. This description only fits if you try to add some hidden variables or some other description that has nothing to do with quantum physics. Uh, if you just stick with uh, what actually happens, you cannot uh, send a message just by using quantum state. So this is the simplest uh, type of causal structure. Uh, we have just two events that are completely causally, causally unrelated. They might be correlated, you might be see correlation in the probability between A and B, but they're not causally related. By changing one, you cannot cause a change in the other. Then the other type of causal structure we've seen is a quantum channel. And in this case, we can send signals. So again, we, we can prepare a state and uh, say this is, uh, uh, let's imagine here uh, we are not even making a, measure, a measurement. We are just preparing a state labeled by X. And here we are measuring a uh, making a measurement labeled by B. And in general, a channel, a channel really is uh, describing a transformation into, of a state into another state, uh, will give us a signaling in the sense that the probability of B will depend on the probability of X. And then we have seen more general things. We have seen the channels with memory that uh, you can imagine that uh, you have a sequence of events and uh, uh, the causal relation might go through some hidden uh, channel. So there, could, there can be ca causal relation from A to B, but it goes through some uh, uh, it's mediated through some environment. So you get more and more complicated causal structures. But so far we've all, always considered uh, situations in which you have a well-defined uh, well order of events. So in the worst case uh, uh, that we've seen so far, in the most complicated case, you have uh, something at time one, time two, time three, and then uh, the previous time can influence the later time, but not the other way around. Another question, is there something more general than that? Uh, and the answer is yes. Um, so there are some, uh, uh, there are things that are uh, uh, simple and more general and things that are uh, a little less simple. So the, uh, the simplest example of uh, something more general uh, is uh, uh, you have to imagine uh, um, a situation where you have two events and you label them A and B, but actually you don't know at what time they're happening. Okay, so typically uh, when we describe physics, we assume that events are labeled by their time, but it's not necessary. You can imagine there is some event, for example, uh, to make a real life example, let's say that the event is the time that uh, uh, your friend arrives uh, at some uh, restaurant by car. Now the time of this event might be uncertain because there is a lot of traffic. And I think in Karachi there is quite some traffic. Mm -hmm. So the event of that might be uncertain. And then maybe say that there is some other event which is uh, uh, dinner is ready, okay, at the restaurant. Uh, and now the, the time of that might be also be uh, uncertain. So the point is that uh, the, the relation between uh, the arrival time and the time the dinner is ready might also be uncertain. So it could be that the, uh, the friend arrives first and later on the dinner gets ready, so the friends can eat the dinner. Or it could be that let the, the dinner is ready. Um, well, okay. The, the, huh? Yeah, the friend comes late and maybe comes so late that dinner got cold and thrown away so he cannot eat the dinner. Uh, you can imagine your favorite scenario, but the, you get the point. Uh, you can imagine scenarios where the, the causal order between events is actually uncertain. It's probabilistically uncertain. Um, and, uh, and so this means that uh, uh, you have some, uh, some situation that uh, um, if you think about physics, you might imagine of having an experiment that you repeat many times. 
and you have uh, maybe two players, Alice and Bob, maybe they are trying to communicate to each other, but then sometimes there will be Alice before Bob, so she will manage to communicate, but Bob will not manage to communicate, and sometimes it's the other way around. So this is a, a scenario that is, uh, um, can very reasonably arise in physics, uh, where you have a probabilistic mixture of causal orders. And so just to uh, very briefly link uh, with those pictures we have drawn so far, um, Let's see if this is good now because this is getting very busy. Um, so how do we represent this? This is a process. Remember each uh, event is a box. So uh, a process is something that uh, you feed in a box and uh, uh, spits out a probability or uh, spits out something else. Again, just, uh, just take this as also even as a, just a very schematic representation. So we have uh, one side is Alice, one side is Bob. And what we mean by, he, by this picture is that we have some general, <coughs> general scenario that we don't know yet uh, if it's A before B or B before A. All, all we know is that uh, Alice can perform a measurement here or a general an operation, and Bob can perform a measurement or an operation here. So Alice receives the system, makes some operation, then sends it out. Bob receives the system, makes an operation, and sends it out. And depending on uh, how this, uh, uh, this picture looks like, it could be that it's A before B or B before A, or it might be a mixture. So, um, so these are uh, um, connected to the formalism we had before. This will be some process matrix. And as a particular case, you could have a process matrix that looks like this. So this will be. Uh, so remember that these are, if this is disconnected, uh, these are a tensor product of three parts. Um, but let's say just this is W1. And so this just represents a scenario where Alice can communicate to Bob. So you see what, what happens here. Alice receives the state, and now I'm bending, uh, I'm bending the wires around, but uh, keep in, remember that the, the, the bending doesn't really matter. All that matters is the connection. So Alice receives the state, then the state travels through a channel and arrives to Bob. While if Bob, uh, do, so what, if Alice prepares the state here, this can influence the outcome of Bob. While if Bob pre prepares something, this just gets lost and never reaches Alice. So this could be one possible uh, scenario, and some other possible scenario could be the other way around. And now, the, uh, the con conceptually, uh, what I wanted to focus on is that uh, these are just two instances of possible causal structure. So uh, typically, in quantum physics, uh, or even in physics, we are not used to uh, to considering, to compare situation where the causal order between events is not known. You, you say either it's A before B, and then I tell you an evolution from A to B, or B is before A, and then I tell you an evolution from B to A. Uh, but in this case, we say, uh, in general, we might not know uh, if it's A before B or B before A. This information is actually encoded in this uh, process matrix. And uh, again, uh, you, you can find out more in, uh, in that paper, uh, connecting with the formalism I've been describing, of uh, how to formally represent this. But for now, just know that uh, in this formalism, we can very easily discuss, we can have a, a process that represents A before B and B before A. And now we can also very easily discuss uh, their probabilistic mixture, which is very simply uh, represented by a convex combination. So if you take W equal P1, W1 plus P2, W2, if you remember, the, um, the probabilities were given by a trace rule, so they were linear in this W object, which means if you now take the, some probability for uh, a communication protocol between Alice and Bob, given this process here, will be P1, the probability for this process, plus P2, the probability for that process, which is exactly what I was describing before. It's a scenario where, uh, with some probability, Alice communicates to Bob through W1, and with some probability, Bob communicates to Alice through uh, w2. So this will be some p1 larger or equal than 0, p2 larger or equal than 0, and then p1 plus p2 equal 1. So these are interesting scenarios because we know how to interpret them. We know uh, how they make sense. We say that the causal order between these two uh, events is uh, unknown, but nonetheless it's definite. It's classical. What we mean is that if we repeat this experiment many times, each time will be a, either A before B or B before A, but each time it will be one of the two. So because this is an important class, we call those processes causally 
separable. And the word uh, is just borrowed from uh, uh, separable states. So the word itself uh, does not carry a, a lot of meaning, except you can think causally separable. You can imagine, you can separate a different run of the experiment in those where it's A before B and B before A. Um, and again, this definition was given in, in this paper here. Um, you can consider the same uh, concept when you add more party, Alex, Bob, Charlie, and so on. Uh, things can become a little more complicated because you can consider a situation where, depending on what Alice does, then the causal order between Bob and Charlie changes. I will not go into the detail. The concept is, uh, remains the same. Causally separable means a scenario where uh, in each run of the experiment, there is a definite causal order, but uh, it might be different from run to run. Another question is, uh, is there something more general? And uh, uh, one of the main reasons to think about uh, something more general comes from, uh, uh, from quantum theory itself. So in quantum theory, we know that uh, you can have uh, uh, definite states. So you can have, uh, uh, if you have uh, a particle, it could be definitely in a position over here, or could be definitely in a position over there. But we also know that uh, can be in a quantum superposition, can be in a superposition of being here plus there. And we know that this superposition doesn't have a classical analog. You cannot interpret it as just a probabilistic mixture of the two. You really have to, to say this is a new genuine state. And so now the question is, is there a new genuine causal relation that uh, appears in quantum theory? Um, and the answer is yes. And I will uh, uh, show you an example. And the example is actually, uh, ah, yeah, maybe. Um, so the example is uh, um, actually something that can be realized uh, in the laboratory. Uh, there are uh, some interpre interpretational uh, caveats that one might, one might add, but I will not go into much detail of that. Uh, it has quite an intuitive uh, um, interpretation of why uh, what I'm going to describe is not a definite causal order, and it has actually been realized. There has been, have been already quite a few experiments. Ah, actually, wait, wait, I wanted to keep that. Uh, quantum, that was gravity. Now it's just quantum. Um, okay, so, um, and this is really, uh, this example is best explained by uh, actually showing the, um, the experiment. Maybe I will uh, write the, um, the references over there. Where are the references? So this is a, a protocol or a process which is uh, usually known in the community as quantum switch. Quantum switch. So this was invented in, uh, um, let me find it. it. Was invented by a group in Pavia in Italy. And it uh, uh, was first described in this paper. 12.01. This paper is probably, is, might not be the best uh, resource, although you should, uh, it should be, it's good enough to, to get the idea of it, but some of the formal aspects are, uh, might be a little confusing. Uh, the, the way I will present, uh, I will present it is related to a particular experimental implementation. Experiment which was done uh, uh, last year and described in, uh, in this paper over here. 04302. So I, I will now uh, describe uh, uh, the experiment as it was performed at the University of Queensland. Uh, this is the one uh, last year. So, okay, the experiment is really simple. It's uh, uh, some uh, optical interferometer. And the optical uh, interferometer, uh, you don't need to understand uh, almost anything of optics to understand this experiment. You just have to know that there are photons, whatever it is a photon. A photon can have polarization, which can be horizontal or vertical, but can also have other degrees of freedom. And in the particular case, this is the shape. Uh, so it can, uh, the shape of the beam, if, you, if this is the beam and you cut across, uh, the shape can, for example, be uh, a Gaussian, so just a circle, or can be a donut, or can have uh, other different shapes. And for the pur purpose of the experiment, there are just two shapes that play a role. 
And uh, uh, the fact that this is um, polarization and, uh, and shape is not really important to understand the experiment, but uh, to understand the concept, because you could use any degree of freedom, but, uh, um, but to, to attach the intuition. So how does it go? So this is always tricky to, to see if I can get it the first time right. It's an interferometer that makes a weird loop. Up. Uh, all right, and here is uh, A, and here is B. Okay, now I'll explain uh, what are all these things. So here is uh, the photon coming in. So here there is some uh, photon source, and there will be some photon that is prepared uh, um, in some state of polarization and uh, internal degree of freedom. Now these, uh, uh, let me put all the mirrors around. <laughs> And let's write it like do it like this. So this object here is a polarizing beam splitter. What it does is that uh, it lets through horizontal polarization and it reflects vertical polarization. Okay? And this A and B are some set of lenses that uh, perform some unitary transformation on uh, the, uh, the shape degree of freedom or uh, orbital angular momentum. Uh, so we, um, we call them uh, the polarization degree of freedom, the control, and the um, uh, shape, we call it the target. And we'll be clear in a second why it is like that. Okay, so now let's imagine that we, we feed the, the state H psi into the interferometer. So this is uh, the control and this is the target. And so now let's see what happens. So H starts from here, and then at this polarizing beam splitter, it's H, so it goes through. And so by going through, it means that uh, the operation A is applied on uh, the target. Okay, so the photon comes here and goes through. Now here is reflected. Here is again a polarizing displitter, so it's H. Because we have a polarization H, again it goes through. It's reflected, goes around. Now it goes back to the same displitter as before. Now it's again it's H, so again it goes through. And then it goes through the second uh, uh, set of lenses that performs um, the operation B. Then reaches this uh, other B splitter because it's still, uh, it was a mistake, uh, because it's still in the H polarization, it again goes through. And so this means, uh, maybe I'll write this, uh, okay, let's write it here. It means that uh, uh, at the output, we will have uh, uh, the target system transform as A, B, and the control system is still H because nothing happened to it. Now let's see what happens if we take a, a vertical photon, a control and target. Now the vertical photon arrives here and when it encounters the splitter, it gets reflected. So it gets reflected and so it goes first through B. So B is applied to the target Oh, is it? Uh, uh -huh. I'll try to, to mark uh, well to make it visible. So it goes through B. So B is applied through to the target. Then again, it needs this beam splitter. And remember, it's vertical, so now it's reflected. So it goes around in the loop. Each of these things is a mirror, so it just uh, directs the photon around. Here, it's vertical, so again, it's reflected. So we go through A. And now it's reflected. Again, it's reflected here. And it goes out exactly in the same place as the horizontal will go. But now uh, we have uh, AB times Psi. So you see why this uh, uh, polarization is called control? Because it controls the order in which these operations are applied to the target. Now what happens if we prepare uh, diagonal polarization? So diagonal polarization is just an equal superposition of uh, horizontal and vertical, and the target is still in some uh, uh, arbitrary state psi. So this is control and this is target. These things have a lifetime, a very short lifetime. So now everything is linear. So uh, a, a fundamental thing of quantum mechanics is that uh, um, Linear superpositions are preserved by uh, unitary evolution, and the evolution here is all unitary. There is no noise. The experiment, there is some noise, but we work with the idealized version. 
And so this goes into an equal superposition of what happens for H and what happens for V. So this is one over square root of two, H uh, V A psi plus V A B psi. Okay? So uh, you see that what happens is that uh, uh, when you have uh, uh, the photon coming out at the end here, uh, it comes out in a superposition of being H, and then in a state corresponding to having A before B, and then B, and then a state corresponding to B before A. So you see that uh, in, uh, in a certain sense, we can see uh, from, from this expression that uh, the, uh, uh, the order between these operations A and B uh, is in a superposition. Uh, strictly speaking, it's not really a superposition, it's entangled with this other state, but uh, uh, it's not classical. So um, a classical uh, mixture will be described by some uh, density matrix. This is a pure state, so there is no uh, probability involved, but still you see that the causal order is not, uh, there isn't one single causal order between the two operations, it's A, B, and B, A. Um, so this is the quantum switch. This is what is uh, uh, typically called uh, uh, indefinite causal order. Um, I will very, very briefly, for uh, who is interested, uh, write you down what is the process matrix uh, representation for this. I will not go into many details. Maybe I will not even uh, write it down. I will just draw the pictures. I'm not sure what to uh, erase. Can I erase this part here? Okay. So one thing that one, uh, one should stress is that uh, uh, if at the end of the day you ignore polarization, you throw it away, uh, then you will have to, uh, you are, will be left with the reduced state for the uh, target, which will be an equal mixture, now classical mixture of having BA before AB, uh, or either BA or AB. So this to say that uh, it's really important that if you do an experiment, uh, if you want to test that what you're doing is actually a quantum control of causal order, you, it's really important that at the end uh, you also measure uh, the polarization. In fact, for many protocols, it's enough to measure the polarization. You don't really have to measure the other thing. Uh, and so as a process, and again, I will just very schematically represent, uh, represent this. Um, let's draw it like this. So uh, as a process, very at the very kind of abstract level, we can represent it in this way. So it's something where uh, we have two empty slots, A and B, which represent the fact that uh, uh, we can insert some unitary. And here we are thinking that, uh, and that's true operationally in the lab, that these A and B uh, lenses are something that we can change. Uh, each run of the experiment, we can just choose which type of unitary operation we can do here. And we, if we had a bit more resources, we could do even uh, uh, not just unitaries, but we could do arbitrary operations, including measurement. The, the experiments just make unitaries, but uh, you could do uh, have something more general. So you have uh, uh, a process where you can uh, input uh, the unitaries that you're performing, and then uh, some state will come out for the control and the target. And, uh, um, uh, and then you can measure it. So now the, the very, uh, very sketchy representation of this is, uh, is the following. Imagine that uh, if you start with the state H, and now I'm, uh, I'm drawing this picture as a, uh, as a pure, uh, uh, in the pure uh, um, process, uh, uh, the pure uh, picture uh, uh, formalism. So if we have uh, the state H, then we have uh, uh, that some state Psi, so I'm, I'm looking at this, uh, what happens here. You have that the state Psi of the target first goes to A, then it's directed to B, and then goes out. Remember this is A and B. So the, the lines are bending around because I want to keep uh, uh, the, uh, the picture over here. So this is the control I measure at the end and this is the target I measure at the end. Um, and if we have V, uh, we have the control going out and then we have this initial state of the target, but now it's wired in the different way. And this is, uh, if you, if you now take uh, uh, the, 
the graphical, uh, the picture rules I have shown you, you can directly translate these uh, into a representation for the process, which I will not do explicitly. It's really not complicated at all, but just in the interest of time, I will uh, leave it at that. So the, the important thing to stress is that, again, this is a process which is pure, so uh, it cannot be a mixture of, of two different things. Anything that is uh, pure in quantum mechanics by construction cannot be, um, if there isn't any classical uncertainty, but it's uh, explicitly written as a sum of something of uh, two processes that are wired uh, in different ways. Uh, so this is an explicit example of a, of a process that uh, uh, has uh, no definite causal order. So the order between A and B is, uh, uh, is not fixed because it's, it's neither A before B nor B before A, but it's also not a classical mixture. So when you repeat the experiment many times, you cannot say this time was A before B and this time was B before A. And, uh, and uh, there are various ways in which you can uh, make some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, unitaries and some uh, uh, measurements that allow you to um, actually verify uh, that this is the case, that uh, what you have is actually, um, so, so that you have some protocol that is also robust to noise. So this is the idealized picture, but then you can come up with some measurement that tells you what you have in the lab is actually uh, not a mixture of causal order. Okay, so this is the, uh, the quantum switch. Is there, is there any question? So that's what we call uh, indefinite, it's a particular example of something we call indefinite causal order, something Amin also mentioned uh, in uh, his lecture. Any question? Okay, so then I think it's time to take our vote. So remember, now you get to decide uh, what to hear for the final part uh, of this uh, lecture. So this is two different contexts in which one can uh, uh, use or uh, discuss uh, essentially the switch. One context is uh, uh, to show that uh, if you have uh, um, some machine, some, some computer, some quantum computer that has access to this resource, you actually get a computational advantage for certain computational tasks. Um, so this is one option of something to discuss about. And uh, this is in principle pr practical applications because we see that uh, uh, one can actually build an uh, experiment of this type. These are uh, kind of toy realizations, but we, one could imagine uh, with different architecture to scale it up. And essentially, it will not be much more difficult than an actual quantum computer. So the, the message there will be that if you have the technology to build a quantum computer that can perform an uh, algorithm be given by quantum circuits, it's not a much bigger effort to build a quantum computer can, that can also do superposition of, uh, of causal order. So this means that if this is in principle something that uh, uh, can be really applied. I mean, there are a lot of questions as for quantum computing, if, if the advantage you get is, uh, is really interesting, if, um, if, it's, uh, uh, for, uh, if there are interesting problems, if it's at all feasible. Yeah. So uh, when you say arbitration, like you see more number of like different causal orders, like if the problem is more complex, you're gonna have instead of two, you're gonna have three or three. Yes, three. so that's one way to obtain an advantage. Okay. So that you can scale it up, and you should see that there is a scaling. And uh, uh, what turns out that uh, um, if you want to talk about computation, so computation has really have some problem, and you want to get some answers say for a decision problem, then the advantage is quadratic, so it's not exponential. It doesn't change your complexity class, but still it's a quadratic advantage which you don't want to throw away. So this is one thing that we can discuss. The second thing is uh, uh, the context of quantum gravity. Uh, and the idea there is that uh, um, in, uh, in general relativity, uh, uh, the mass uh, determines the causal structure of space-time. Uh, so this means that if I have uh, some massive system, depending on where I put it, I can actually change the causal structure of events uh, that unfold after I, I chose where to put the mass. And then we can, so uh, there is uh, one way to, um, to imagine some situation uh, in quantum gravity, well, in a situation where you can have a superposition of, of massive objects, uh, that leads to indefinite causal order in that sense. Um, okay, so uh, are you ready to take the vote? The options are A and B. Uh, so, uh, wait, wait, wait. So, who votes for A? One, two, three, four. A is computational advantage. So that was four. Uh, five, okay. Who votes for B? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so B wins. Okay, so uh, 
So uh, this paper here is the reference for the computational advantage if you want to learn independently. Just so you know, there are actually more works about other types of advantages that you can get from this stuff. So there is not just computation, but there is also communication complexity. Then there are other things that have to do with communication, some tasks. So some things are, uh, let's say, a little better defined as what type of advantage you get, some things a little less. But there is a lot of go lot going on, a lot of research going on in that topic. So that's, uh, this will be your reference, 1401.8127. Okay, gravity. So, huh. so what happens with gravity? So, as I was saying, uh, gravity, uh, as formulated, the theory of gravity as formulated by Einstein and friends, uh, so it wasn't actually alone, but uh, uh, it's mostly due to him, is essentially a, is a geometrical, uh, um, it's a geometrical theory in the sense that uh, um, uh, the explanation that one gets for gravity, for the fact that the bodies attract to each other uh, and so on, is not that there is any force, but is that uh, is due to the geometry of space-time. So uh, there is a way to assign um, a metric, so a geometry to space-time, and this tells you how to, uh, how to calculate uh, angles. So metric uh, tells you how to calculate angles, tells you how to calculate distances, but also tells you how to calculate time intervals. So in, a relativ in, a, in, a, in relativity, and that's actually also in a special relativity, uh, the interval, the time interval between two events is not something uh, uh, fixed a priori, but it depends uh, on uh, uh, on the physical situation. So the typical example is of a twin paradox. Uh, you have two rockets with two twins of the same age. Uh, well, okay, we have one rocket and one twin stays on Earth, and then another goes on on a trip at very very high speed, and then it comes back. And uh, when they get back together, the uh, twin that was traveling is younger. So this is called time dilation, and it's a very real uh, uh, effect. It's something that has been uh, uh, um, demonstrated in many experiments, and actually it's something that is taken into account in uh, um, whenever you use your phone for, uh, for uh, geolocation. Uh, the, the GPS satellites have to take into account uh, time dilation to get the synchronization right. There is a story that I don't know if it's true, that uh, the first time they sent some uh, satellite in orbit, the engineers didn't believe the physicists, so they put uh, some clock, some system that didn't take time dilation into account, and then they were getting the, the things wrong. So just to say that uh, not very long ago, people actually didn't believe uh, time dilation was, uh, was a real thing. In the 70s, there was a whole issue of, uh, uh, of physics, of the Journal of uh, Physics of the American Physical Society devoted to discuss, is it real or is it just a mathematical artifact? So now we know it, it's very, very real. So operationally, what it means is that if you get uh, uh, two clocks, and they're subject to different accelerations, um, they get desynchronized. So I will maybe um, write one, uh, make one picture and one uh, equation for that. So say that you have, uh, uh, you have an experiment above Earth. So this is some big mass. Uh, this thing will start to be, maybe I can try to use the, maybe the green one will go better. Or, So, okay, imagine a big planet down here, or a big mass. And then here are two, two heights, H1 and H2. And then you, you make an experiment where you, you take two clocks, and one you keep at, H, at height H1, and the other you keep at height H2. And you do it such that uh, you, you synchronize the clocks when they're at the same level, then uh, you take them, uh, uh, you take one above, and you assume that this takes a short time, so it doesn't have a, an influence, and then after you wait for a long time, you take this other over there, and then you compare them. So, uh, so this happens in, the gravi in a gravitational field. So there is a gravitational field uh, with acceleration g, this is small g, say the uh, acceleration on Earth, and uh, uh, the time dilation, uh, so the proper time uh, shown by each, each clock. So if you have some, uh, some clock in the laboratories at Earth uh, that tells you that the whole experiment took a time uh, small t, the actual time that will take to the two clocks uh, will be gh over c squared, over 
T square times T. So this means that uh, when you combine the two clocks, you will have, uh, so this is for a generic height H, the proper time differential will be G H2 minus H1 over T square T. So, okay, so this is uh, um, the only uh, formula I, I want to write about time dilation. You can get it. Uh, so this is, strictly speaking, is an approximation where you consider the gravitational field is constant. And you can get it from a much more general formula of general relativity that uh, tells you, given the metric, given the space-time metric, it allows you to calculate the proper time along any trajectory. Um, yeah? So tau is the proper time shown by the clock going around, the, uh, st staying at a fixed height h, while small t is the coordinate time. So this we can think of coordinate time as some reference time we, we put on Earth, or more generally, some way to parameterize uh, uh, our experiment. The point is that uh, uh, in general relativity, you really only can operationally talk about relative quantities. So every time you want to talk about some time, it, it has to be to have a, a physical meaning. It must be the time of something that you can interpret as a clock. Oh, sorry, C is the speed of light. 10 to the eight, uh, three times 10 to the eight uh, meter per second. Yes, so this is the speed of light. Okay, so this is the formula for time dilation uh, in a gravitational field. Uh, it's, uh, uh, so when you have the special relativistic effect, it's easier to remember that uh, the twin traveling comes back younger. Here, uh, it's easy to forget which one is younger, so the, the catchphrase is uh, uh, lower is slower. So the, the clock that stays at the lower level is that one that runs slower, and so it can, can, will come back younger in the twin uh, uh, paradox experiment. And again, this is, has, has been done, I mean, it has been done uh, with satellites and so on, but it has been done actually in, in this very way, by taking clocks on the track, going up the mountain, then going down the mountain. This is really something very, very well established. It's, I, I think it's fascinating because this is an actual form of, of time travel as far as you can define time travel. It's time travel to the future, but it is time travel in the sense that uh, uh, um, if, you are the if you are this clock, it takes you less to travel to the time of that clock. So it's effectively a, a travel uh, to the future. Um, so how do we use this for, uh, for uh, making up a quantum switch? Yes? Oh, g, small g, is uh, the gravitational acceleration on Earth, so it's a 9.8 meter pi by second square. Or it's the gravitational acceleration of wherever you are. But let's say if you were to do the experiment right here, g will be around 9.8 meters times uh, time second square. So it's the gravitational acceleration uh, near Earth. Okay? So you can get... Uh, um, well, this is the approximated formula you can get. Uh, if you go away from the, um, well, you can have more general formula if you are not in this regime, but just uh, if, you, if you consider a gravitational body, then just knowing it's uh, the gravitational potential that it generates allows you to calculate the time dilation. So you all know how to calculate the potential generated by, the Newtonian potential generated by a mass. So it's a one over R law, so that's how it will scale in general. But it's, the details are not really that important. So, okay, now uh, imagine the following scenario. I uh, have uh, uh, two laboratories. Um, again, when I talk about laboratories, it's an easy way to go and talk about events uh, uh, and physical things, but that's to make uh, things easier to understand. Uh, I have two laboratories, and in each laboratory there is a clock. And now we will arrange a, a protocol where at a certain time, as, uh, as given by the laboratory clock, uh, some operation will be made. So we want to define an event in uh, some, some uh, laboratory, and uh, the label of this event is the time given by a local clock. And remember that in general relativity, that's really the only way you can physically define an event. Uh, you cannot say there is position three. Position three doesn't make sense. You have to say this event happens when uh, the clock shows uh, three o'clock. This is well defined. Otherwise, uh, uh, it's not really clear what one is talking about. So. You have this clock over here, and we can uh, mark the ticking of this clock. And uh, we put another clock over here, and we mark the ticking of this clock. And uh, um, so this is, say, clock A, or, uh, well, 
Um, okay, you have the two clocks, and uh, using these two clocks, you, you identify two events, the event A and event B. So each event is defined as uh, uh, the um, the event corresponding to a particular prearranged time of the clock. So let's say this could be two o'clock for this clock, and this could be also be two o'clock for this clock. Um, and we arrange this scenario that, such that if the clocks are just uh, uh, in Minkowski space time, so there is no mass, no gravity around, uh, we arrange that such that these two events are space like separated. So space like separated means uh, that uh, um, uh, they cannot be connected by anything traveling uh, at the speed of light or slower. And uh, uh, this means that there is no physical signal that can connect A and B. So this means that if you're trying to make an experiment, where uh, as I was saying before, Alice performs some operation and Bob performs some operation, there is no way to causally influence A to B or B to A. These two things are causally, uh, uh, causally disconnected. Um, and we can imagine, uh, well, okay, so this is the basic, uh, the, the starting scenario. But now imagine that uh, uh, someone arrives with some big mass. So this is a player that is independent of those two and can decide whether to put the big mass next to Alice or next to Bob. So what happens if you put the mass next to Alice? Then, as we said, uh, the clock sticking close to Alice will run slower. So now uh, keep in mind the time is, uh, is running upward in this picture and uh, the, this other direction is space. So if we put, uh, uh, so we have two possible configuration. Configuration one, we have uh, uh, the, the mass close to Alice. So her clock will start at the same point but will tick slower. So when we ask Alice, please perform your experiment at two o'clock, it will be over here. While Bob is very far from the mass, so his uh, two o'clock is where it was before. And if your mass is big enough and you keep it there for long enough, then you can have that A is actually in the causal feature of B, which means that there is a, uh, some signal that can be sent from B to A. So in particular, we can imagine that we prepare some quantum state, which we will call target, not by, by chance. Uh, and we arrange it such that uh, the state goes first to Bob, and then because Bob is before Alice, it then can actually reach Alice. Um, so this is a configuration where the mass is to the left, and if say Alice and Bob each perform some operation on the target at the prescribed time, this evolves to L A B psi. Now say that you put the um, maybe use again this space over here because uh, then I don't have to go far on the side. I think this is more visible. So now say that uh, you put your mass to the left instead. So your big mass is over here. So here is, sorry, this was to the left and this is to the right. Then uh, Bob's clock is slowed down. So two o'clock for Bob is over here and uh, two o'clock for Alice is uh, where it will be without mass. Assuming that these are far enough that uh, the influence of, uh, of the mass is only on, on the clock nearby and not the one far away. So in this case, the event of Alice is before the event of Bob. So again, if we prepare our target system in some state psi, we send it through Alice, and then we send it through Bob, we will have A being performed before B, and uh, uh, the mass will be in state R. Okay, um, so there are a lot of details that uh, one could uh, cover. For example, here it looks like that you have to send the state, uh, the direction in which you have to send the state is either right or left, depending on which of the two protocols you can uh, perform. It's actually poss possible to do everything such that the only thing that is different in the protocol is uh, uh, the position of the mass and uh, everything else is done the same. This is not very intuitive, but it's actually possible to do such that uh, you send the state psi always in the same direction and, then, and the protocol is done just such that uh, it ends up uh, first to B and then to A or first to A and then to B um, uh, depending on the two scenarios. So that really the only thing that changes is, uh, is the order of the two events and not the direction in which you send the, uh, the, the state. And again, there are a lot of details which are covered in this paper here. Uh, it has gone through many, many review rounds. Every re review round uh, 
we will add some, uh, some appendix, so now there is really a lot of stuff there, but it will be published in, uh, in the next week or two. So um, actually this is a very old version. If you wait a couple of weeks, there will be the update. It will be published in uh, Nature Communication, so in case uh, you can look it up there. Um, okay, so, so the thing is that uh, I think you, you will recognize what's going on here. Uh, we have uh, pretty much the same expression as uh, we were having before. We have uh, some control system, in this case it's the mask, and depending on the control, we have uh, two different orders in which this oper an operation is uh, applied on the target. So now, and this is uh, somehow a, a leap of faith or an assumption, if we assume that uh, uh, it is possible to prepare uh, arbitrarily massive object in superposition, and this is something that is not experimentally proven, but if you, uh, if you keep uh, uh, the linearity of quantum mechanics, this will be true, then it should be possible to prepare the mass in a superposition of uh, being right or being left. There is nothing in the physics we know that uh, forbids us to, uh, to prepare this state. And if we do it, and again, if nothing wrong happens with the linearity of quantum mechanics, uh, this uh, scenario will evolve into the situation one over square root of two uh, right um, B after A plus left A after B. So you see that this is really the same, uh, the same expression as where we having for the, that uh, we presented for the switch. Uh, so that's how uh, time dilation, uh, general relativity, can, uh, um, can be used to produce a superposition or better say a quantum control of causal order. Can be used to uh, prove an, an indefinite causal order or, or quantum. Um, so this is, I think, uh, as much as I want to say on the board, uh, as I want to draw, um, there will be a, a lot of things to, uh, to add, um, and I will not go into many details. One is, uh, one could ask, uh, okay, what is the difference between what is going on here and what was going on in the lab? Is it that it's just the same thing, or is it that the lab one was a simulation of that? Um, I will not go in deep detail, but uh, uh, the point to make is that uh, in the lab, uh, the events were not specified relative to clocks. We just say our event is the photon going through set of, uh, a set of lenses that perform a transformation. That was our only definition of event. Well, here we are saying the event is actually timed. Uh, we are actually saying the event is, uh, is, uh, uh, is defined as uh, two o'clock for uh, a local clock that we are defining there. And the whole protocol doesn't depend at all of what type of clock uh, is, uh, is doing your timekeeping. And this is a very important feature of general relativity that, uh, uh, that allows one to give this geometrical interpretation to say that what is happening is really that uh, uh, time is slowed down. It's not just that gravity affects an inner mechanism of a clock. So you could, have, you could think of gravity affecting a mechanism of a clock. Think of a, of a pendulum that you use to keep track of time. Now obvi obviously if you let the pendulum free fall, so if you remove gravity, this will not swing in the same way. So if you're trying to use that as a clock, well, obviously uh, it will not work in the same way. Now this is not the same thing that is happening here. So here, if you take something that you believe is a, is a, um, uh, is a good clock, so that is not uh, changing depending on what forces are acting around, then all of them will agree in saying, uh, this is our two o'clock event. It doesn't really depend if it's an atomic clock, if it's uh, uh, some mechanism, anything will agree that this is two o'clock. So in this sense, uh, uh, what we are doing with gravity is in a more genuine sense, a superposition that has to do with space-time geometry and not just with the causal order of two events defined in the lab. Um, other things that one could add is that uh, um, one could ask how do you, uh, so this is just uh, formal, we show that you can prepare the state, but again, one could uh, uh, go a bit further and uh, and uh, define a protocol where uh, uh, you don't only prepare the state, but you, you define some operations uh, that finally allows you to perform a task um, that proves that uh, what you're doing is actually a, a superposition of causal structure. So the, uh, uh, one can develop a concept, and this is in the title of this paper. It's, uh, uh, so fun th these are not the titles of the paper, so they're just a topic. The title of this paper is uh, um, uh, Bell Inequalities for Time Order or something like that. Uh, it doesn't matter. So the point is that you can come up with some sort of Bell inequality. So standard Bell inequality allows you to say our experiment is incompatible with a local realistic uh, description of our variable. You cannot say that 
when I make this measurement, it's because there was a predefined variable that had a classical value. In the same way, you can come up with an experiment here that says uh, the result of the experiment is incompatible with uh, a predefined causal order. It's incompatible with saying that there was some causal order that maybe we didn't know. So you can come up with a scheme that will be a bit more complicated for, uh, than this. There will be four clocks and they uh, will interact, they will, protocol will be uh, a little more involved, but, uh, but essentially it boils down to exploiting uh, uh, this superposition in the right way. Um, so this is more or less the end of, uh, of what I wanted to say. So um, we still have a, a little of time. I don't think we have to go until the end. But so maybe if, uh, if there are some questions or some discussion or some, some thoughts. Uh, the way you mean this compared to time, yeah. when you go a bit on the map, so time, uh, time lapse usage or uh, what is happening? So if you, if you put your mass close to the clock, and remember, uh, you, you are only allowed to, to, to speak in relative terms. So close to the clock means closer than another clock. Then the clock closer to the mass runs slower. So, uh, like right now on the Earth, whatever the clock says, is running slower. Yes, so if you compare a clock right here with the clock uh, over on Mount Everest, uh -huh. then the one on Mount Everest will run faster and this will run slower. And slower means that, uh, uh, so. Uh, on the Earth, it can happen actually. Um, this happens, yes. This has been tested. I don't think it has been tested with Everest. It has been no, tested no, with. No, no, no. Uh, so it has been tested on, on mountains in Italy for sure. I know that. So people really have taken a, a bunch of clocks, uh, a bunch of clock legs. Still being near the mass. Huh? Still being near the mass. Yeah, but farther away. So the. Further from the center of the Earth. Yes, exactly. So not from Mars. So the mass is. So what matters for this, uh, for this age is really the. So again, it's, uh, what matters there is the Newtonian gravitational potential. So you know that you can use Gauss theorem, and then all that matters is if you have a big mass. So, so this definitely affects it. Relative gravity will affect, or the regard mass in m and f are you go from the center. Yeah. So the acceleration between that. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But uh, if you go in mass, the mass is very constant. So the mass, uh, the mass of Earth is constant, but uh, the distance of your clock is different. So the, the potential is different. So as, as you go up, your potential becomes higher. It's very different since you know, mass is very constant actually. If you are even at a, I mean, Mount Everest or anywhere else, the mass is there. So the mass is constant. What changes is the distance between the center of mass exactly. and, uh, and the clock. So, so that what uh, really plays the... the um, force of gravity. Sorry? It depends on the force of gravity. So not on the force, but on the potential. Yes, so because uh, in this case, for example, if you do the experiment in a, a linear approximation, the force here is the same as the force there, but the potential is different. So uh, in, a, in a regime where you cannot distinguish the force. And I have to give you the potential is more. Yes. Yes, and uh, so more potential means the clock runs faster. Less potential, so re remember that the potential, the gravitational potential goes, uh, goes down. So um, maybe I'll, uh, I'll put it here. So, if, uh, so if this over here is the potential, say phi, and this is your distance from the mass, say r, then your potential goes like this, right? So the, the deeper you are, uh, the closer you are to the center of mass, the smaller the potential, so you're deep in the well, and uh, as you go far away, uh, you go to zero. I mean, the, the height of this is arbitrary. You, you, by, by default, you set uh, that is zero when you're very far away. You're looking at for one event, uh, if you're taking to one at Earth. So for the same event, it will take more time away from the Earth. So it takes, uh, uh, it takes longer when, um, so again, lower is lower. So the thing is that the clock closer to the Earth runs slower, which means that uh, when you then compare them, this will be uh, earlier, and the one that was up will be later. So, yeah. Um, yes, it takes more time to the one up there, and it takes less time for the one down there. Yes. Yeah. It depends on potential. Yes, it depends on potential. So it, it depends on the metric. That will be the real ger general relativistic thing. But in a, in linear approximation, when you can talk about uh, uh, a Newtonian potential, it depends on the potential. So mass is fixed. So this is just a really, uh, it's really, you know, you, you know that uh, uh, you fix the mass and then you have different potential down here and down there. 
So the, the, the formula is, yeah, it's a formula that depends on mass. So you can, also, you can also get a difference if you compare a big mass and a small mass. That's another way to do it. It's just that's less practical because we are on Earth and the mass of Earth is fixed. So what type of issues? Maybe, what, what could prevent you? I mean, this is all a speculative physics to some extent. So there are people that think that you should be prevented doing these things, but certainly not the math or, uh, or not the superposition principle of quantum mechanics or anything in the physics that we know today. So there is no logical contradiction. If you're worried that uh, uh, this will create something like a closed time lag curve, uh, that's not happening because this is not uh, one causal structure where you go forward in time and then you end up in the same uh, point. So here we, are, uh, we have two classical causal structures and each classical causal structure, the, the time order is well defined. It's just that now we're considering a superposition of the two. So this is uh, uh, really, and, and look, this is, uh, I think the, the, the the biggest experts in quantum gravity can really get confused about this point. It's, uh, it's quite subtle. Um, but it's different to talk about uh, uh, one space time, which is classical, it's all the, the, written in the classical laws of physics, and then uh, you have a causal structure that goes around in a loop. And then comparing two space times where the causal structure is different. And so, so if you really want to push it further, we don't really have a theory to, to describe arbitrary quantum states of gravity. So this is one of the main open question, how do you write a the theory of quantum gravity? But what we, we have is that uh, we have a, one particular scenario that we can fully describe with the tools that we have now. Even if there isn't, uh, so you cannot think that uh, this is one space time and then there are uh, things happening on them. These are two different space time and they're in a superposition. So there are things happening, but not in one causal structure, in a superposition of two causal structures. And so no loops ever arise. So, and I mean, th there is quite a lot more to do. So. For example, you can write the, the process matrix description of this, and you will uh, uh, see that uh, the normalization conditions are satisfied. The normalization conditions are those that tell you that there is no logical contradiction. Everything, uh, uh, everything that, uh, that happens is, is perfectly allowed. So, so there is no grandfather paradox or anything like that. This uh, you mean this? So this is, uh, well, this is just a description of uh, uh, how the initial state evolves to the final state. But this is a, 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 um, this is a simple description. You can give more detailed description. So one uh, a bit more detailed description is uh, through a quantum process. So a quantum process just doesn't, doesn't only tell you how a first state evolves to a final state. It's a more general thing where uh, uh, the variables are uh, all the operations that you do at the different events. So this is this uh, higher order process that I was discussing about and uh, allows you to discuss that. But actually there is also some, uh, some different type of description one can give and uh, well, I'm, I don't want to, uh, to create confusions, but uh, so it turns out that in fact, you can, you can uh, use some uh, common time coordinates for these two scenarios. This might not be obvious, but uh, the fact that there, there are different causal structures doesn't mean that you cannot use one time coordinate, just uh, to give you a pictorial example. So if you have some time coordinate, uh, this is a, a, a time coordinate if your light cone is this way, but also it's a time like coordinate if your light cone is this way. So just to say it is possible to find a coordinate uh, that is a time like coordinate, so it does describe time for both of these causal structures. And then you can use this coordinate to describe time evolution in ordinary Hamiltonian formalism. And so, in fact, you can also describe the whole thing, forgetting about the whole story about causal structure. You will have a physical description for your clock described by an Hamiltonian that drives its evolution. And then a physical description for uh, uh, your system that are driving in, uh, uh, traveling in different direction and a description for your mass. And then you describe everything in continuous time evolution. So it's not anymore this diagrammatic or a circuit thing where you have things happening in blocks. You can really have a continuous time description of everything. And uh, at the end of the day, it will give you the same result. So it will give you a violation of the inequality, preparation of the state, and so on. So, so there are different levels of details at which you can describe this, and they all, uh, uh, they all agree in the final physical prediction.
Any more questions? So um, yeah, we can also chat uh, over dinner or uh, yeah, you can, uh, you have some remaining question, you can send some email or, or uh, you have some literature to explore uh, uh, to look up these things. So, um, well, if that's it, I would like to thank you everybody for uh, staying until the very end. I think it was, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, just, just wanted to say it, is, uh, it was a very nice event, a very nice call. I really enjoyed the atmosphere and, uh, and the participation. So I think we should all uh, uh, thank Gibran for putting it together. Thank you.